Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Perry Clausen, uh, the executive director of the Valley Water Collaborative. And of course, the phone rings. Let me turn that on mute. Uh, today is the first in a series of what we're calling stakeholder meetings that are be that's going to that will be organized for the Modesto and Turlock Management Zone development. Uh, the plan, and you'll we'll get into more details later, is to have these meetings about monthly. And some of you are on multiple mailing lists. We are also having parallel community engagement meetings that will be less of a, I guess I would call it deeper drill into the technical and regulatory components of this regulation. So um, not to be confused, these meetings are gonna be the ongoing uh, effort to keep those who are interested in, in participating in some level with the management zone development. Of course, the WDR holders will certainly be involved, but we have what we call the stakeholders, which is then the individuals that, like Rob, who was talking a minute ago with Cal California League of Food Producers, has members that are involved in water districts, GSAs, and others that will be uh, hopefully staying closely involved as we develop these presentations or as we develop the plans and implement the plans. So, next. So, next slide, please. So before we get started, I want, uh, I'm going to have um, an introduction to our Zoom protocols here. We've all been on Zoom meetings, but I'm going to let, uh, let a better expert explain exactly what it is uh, that we're going to be doing through the protocol of this meeting. Good afternoon, everybody. Lydia Holland here. So it, for, the, for the guidelines for the Zoom meeting, we have a, a few things we want to cover. Um, so we ask that everybody identifies themselves in the participant panel with a first and last name. If you are calling in from a phone number and that is what appears as your name in the participant list, we ask that you go in and, and re-identify yourself with a first and last name so that we can accurately uh, capture everyone that participated in the meeting today. Also, we ask that if you are not speaking, if you could remain on mute through the duration of the meeting until we get to the Q&A periods, that would be great. Um, we will stop the presentation at two places to allow for questions to be asked. The first pause will be after presenting the introductory information and the regulatory background. The second will be at the end of the presentation. If you have a question during the Q&A time period, there are two ways that you can ask your question. We ask that you click the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Once you are recognized, please unmute yourself to ask the question. The other option is to use the chat feature in Zoom by clicking the chat icon. You can tap your, type your question um, and, and I will read your uh, question to the panel uh, to be addressed. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the, the meeting, please use the chat function and one of the hosts will help the best that we can to provide assistance. Thank you. Okay, and Lydia is gonna be helping out throughout the, the meeting to watch for the hands raised and such. So uh, Richard and I will focus on our presentations and we'll have gaps in between for questions. No, we won't wait till the end, so next. So I want to just go over briefly the agenda items that we're going to talk about today. First, I want to give you a background on the Valley Water Collaborative and what we're doing to work on these management zones. Uh, Richard Meyerhoff will then uh, talk about the regulatory background. We'll pause then after that segment and have a Q&A and then he will continue, Richard will continue further. He's with GEI Consultants uh, talking about the management zone development preliminary management zone characterization, discharge or outreach, early action plan, and then we'll go into moving forward and next steps, and then have a final Q&A. So we, we certainly don't want this to be a one-way conversation, so please don't hesitate to raise your hand if something's not clear. We've scheduled this for two hours. I think we can get finished in two hours, but we don't wanna rush through this and uh, make sure uh, it's, everything we talk about is clear as, as we can make it. So next. 
So the purpose of the meeting is to introduce you to the Valley Water Collaborative. Uh, we were formed to manage the Modesto Turlock Management Zones. Uh, we also have to, uh, this is our first meeting to initiate the stakeholder process. And we, we have a huge plan, and you'll hear about these in a, in a bit, a number of plans that need development in the next few months. Um, our first big deliverable is March 8th, so we certainly want stakeholders to be involved in that in these two regions. And then, you know, provide also con today the con nitrate control program requirements, give you an overview of that. Uh, we, we won't go into in-depth details. We can certainly do that in, in sub subsequent meetings. And then talk about this preparation of the, the first report, preliminary management zone proposal, and also importantly, the early action plan, which is the, the core, and key implementation effort that we need that's gonna be really providing safe drinking water within the management zone area. Okay, next. So Valley, the Valley Water Collaborative was started uh, last July was when we filed our actual documents to the state and federal government. And we, we are, are an operating California entity the idea came out from a number of us involved in CV Salts over the years when we realized, especially in the East San Joaquin area, that we had two, uh, two priority basins, three priority basins that we were gonna need to deal with in the East San Joaquin area only. So we were looking for ways to save administrative costs and, and realize the economies of scale. So we are, we're managed by a board of directors. I'll show you a list in, in a minute. We're based in Modesto and you can read the, the mission down there. I won't read what's in front of you, but we're really, we really wanna engage in activities with the goal of protecting and enhancing the quality of groundwater used as drinking water in these two basins. Okay, next. Oh, and one thing I'll mention here while the slide's changing is this is going to, this slideshow will be uh, posted on the uh, Valley Water Collaborative website. So to give you a conceptual outline of what, how Valley Water Collaborative is, is structured, we have our two priority basins, Modesto and Turlock, and then priority two basin, which will have the same requirements kicking in in probably a year to two years. So we anticipate that the, the collaborative would be the managing entity for the administrative activities of those basins. And then uh, we have our board of directors uh, that has been seated now, and you'll see a list in a second. And that, that as you see that the divider line in the middle, the top half is really gonna be the business management. Then the bottom half is gonna be the implementation. And because each of these basins require a separate plan, we're, we're gonna be forming basin specific committees Modesto, Turlock, and then eventually Merced that will work on the specific plan elements and also help in, in providing the budgets and, and seek localized input on the plan that would then be brought to the board of directors, also to facilitate local outreach, water delivery activities. And then these committees are gonna be very broad. It would even be beyond the folks that are on this call. And it's kind of a come one, come all, whoever wants to be involved. And I will tell you that the committees initially, I know for, um, for next month and probably January, February, we're gonna probably have back-to-back -back committee meetings. In other words, we may have an ES, a Valley Water Collaborative Board meeting, and then the first half hour is Modesto, second hour is Turlock. At some point, it will necessitate separate meetings. But for now, we want to, again, try to economize our, all of our time. And the development of the plans are very similar and very par parallel in both basins. OK, next. And the, the, the advantage of the collaborative approach, we realized this in the Irrigated Lands Program with uh, 17 years ago, we formed the East San Joaquin Water Coalition when there was a similar potential of the counties, Madera, Merced, Madera, Stanislaw County, having to have separate entities for, for implementation of the Irrigated Lands Program. We think that model is, is usable. It has been verified that it does work. And the idea with this group is we want to have uh, 
reduce any duplication of efforts, of course, and that is in administrative management, you know, the planning of these zones, uh, activities, because many are, well, all of them have similar hydrology and water reads, needs, and then also maximizing the outreach potential that we could use by working together. Someday we're going to be in the water uh, delivery uh, installation of fill stations business, and we certainly want to realize economies of scale when we can when we're purchasing the, this equipment and services. And then over time, there, there's going to be operations and maintenance gonna, that's going to be needed both for systems and, and the deliveries. So we want to optimize that. Some point also in our medium term, we would like to us we would like to pursue grants from state or other entities and with with a larger footprint if you will of the of the Deep valley water collaborative it, we were hoping this would be more attractive to funders to see that we have the larger population a larger area versus having a, a smaller a smaller man, uh, sub zone or sub basin. And they're not small, the basins are not small by any stretch of the imagination, but in this case, when we're pursuing public funds, it could be more attractive to have a larger area. And then and as well, these projects where we can, we're gonna try to be, uh, have a similar approach in addressing the nitrate impacts and, uh, and, and all these three are contiguous. And then it's just really more efficient use of time for those uh, representing the WDR holders and the impacted communities. Okay, next. So the Valley Water Collaborative itself is uh, the structure of the organization. As I mentioned earlier, we have a board of directors, uh, executive director, which is myself, staff and consultants, and then the committees. And our board of directors is currently is made up of agriculture, dairy, city, poultry, food processors, and wineries. Uh, myself was appointed by the board of directors, and I have a small staff, and we have a GEI and Ludar Scalmanini that are helping us with the um, technical activities, and then also we'll have these committees with some oversight. And then each of these committees, the basin specific committees will have budget and financial oversight and help with the individual planning and operation and public outreach. So these, uh, you know, the, the overall responsibilities you can see on the left, we've talked about those already and we have these plans that must be developed and, and within our management zones, we've already realized that we don't have poor water quality impacted groundwater from nitrates all across the basins. So we, we expect that we will be prioritizing efforts within our management zones so that we can make sure that we are hitting the areas of highest need first and then helping in that coordination of operation and maintenance. Okay, the next slide. So here you see the listing of our board members. Uh, we have agriculture, well, we have the major industries in our uh, valley that are represented here on the board of directors. And again, I'll be sending this out later so you'll be able to see each one of these individuals. Some of them I'm, I'm hoping are going to be able to make the calls today and our future stakeholder meetings. So next. And then uh, the listing of the staff, myself, uh, Courtney Maureen, and then our consultants, GEI, and Ludor Scalmanini, with the lead being on, Richard Meyerhoff will be on the, uh, following me in the presentation, and Vicki Kressinger is a lead at the Ludor Scalmanini. The other thing that's really important that, is, that really has been behind getting this operation going, this collaborative organized, has been the organizations you see listed here. And, you know, they, some of them are on, I was talking to Rob a little earlier, I'm not sure of the other ones, but if you're affiliated with them or know them, don't hesitate to pick up the call. They've been tracking this since day one. So any of the, myself, the consultants or the affiliated organizations are available to, to answer questions and, and be a resource as this rolls forward. Next. Okay, now we're gonna slip, uh, switch to the regulatory background. Richard Meyerhoff will talk about the nitrate control program, give you an overview of what, what that is. All right, thank you, Perry, and good afternoon, everybody who's on this call today. Uh, next slide, please. 
We want to just give a very brief overview of the nitrate control program. Many of you have heard this probably maybe one too many times, but just in case, there are some people on this uh, meeting that have not heard the, uh, the short version of why we're here. We want to give a little bit of background. Uh, the nitrate control program that drives this program, or the, what the whole purpose of this uh, meeting is, what became effective back in January of this year. There are three key goals that need to be addressed through implementation of the program over a many year period. First and foremost is to address drinking water concerns because of high nitrate, uh, those uh, areas that are potentially impacted by elevated nitrate in drinking water. The second goal is to reduce nitrate impact, so looking forward, no longer degrade water quality, so we have better uh, water quality going forward. And finally, to the extent that's reasonable, feasible, and practical, good regulatory language there, uh, restore groundwater quality so it does meet nitrate water quality objectives in the future. So that would apply in situations where the groundwater is already impacted. Is there a possibility of restoring it back to uh, be better water quality and actually meeting the objective in the future? That's a long-term goal. Implementation is done by groundwater subbasins. They've been prioritized in the regulation. There are two priorities that are named in the regulation. Priority one groundwater subbasins are shown in the little table to the right. As you can see, Modesto and Turlock, which is the focus of this meeting, is are included in this first priority. There is also a list of priority two subbasins, which I've not provided here. But uh, rest assured, there are plenty around you in the Central Valley that will also be implementing this program over time. Permitted dischargers who are in the list of subbasins on the right should have received a notice to comply with the program back in May, uh, well, it was delivered on May 29th, 2020, or mailed May 29th, and would have received it soon after. Next slide. When you receive the notice to comply, you have two choices. To comply with the overall nitrate control program, you have to opt to be path A, which is to implement the nitrate control program requirements uh, effectively on your own. You work as an individual discharger to meet all the requirements of the program. In contrast, path B, if you choose that compliance pathway, you would then work collectively with other dischargers to implement the program requirements through a management zone, which is why we're here today. We're forming a management zone in this area and giving you information about this management zone. So you, if you want to choose Path B, you know what your opportunity is around you. Next slide. So what does each discharger need to do? If we have a discharger on the phone and you're still curious or not clear, all dischargers that receive that notice to comply must submit their notice of intent as to how you uh, intend to comply with the program by May 7th of 2021. So about a little more than six months from now. The, those that choose path A, there are a set of requirements in the regulations that you need to deal with and you submit your notice of intent addressing those uh, requirements. And we're not gonna go over those today because those would be dischargers that want to implement the program as an individual discharger. Path B, which is where we're focused today, is you have the way you reply to your notice to comply depends on what you choose to do and probably better said when you decide to join the management zone. If you join now, for example, and participate in the development of the first deliverable for the management zone, which we will talk about more in a little bit, the so-called preliminary management zone proposal, and you have stated your intent to participate before that document is due, which is March 8th of 2021, your notice of intent is that document. You will be included in there, uh, information about your facility be included, and you are moving forward now as part of the management zone. If after March, as of March 8th, you have not joined the management zone, but between March 8th and May 7th, when you must ultimately deliver your notice of intent, you decide to join the management zone, you certainly can, and you would then still have to do really two things. One, you would have to submit notice to the regional board by letter that you have decided to join the management zone that's forming around you, and also begin working with the management zone and reach out to them directly. Um, but I want to reiterate, if you join the management zone prior to March 8th and you are included in the proposal, that is your response to your notice to comply. And that's all I'm gonna say about the regulations. The uh, link that's provided on the screen here uh, starts with a bunch of information about the nitrate control program and uh, leads you many directions if you really want to dig uh, deep into the program. Next slide. 
Okay, so that, that's the foundation. That, that's what triggers the concept of a management zone forming. So let's talk a little bit very briefly about what's being formed. So the next slide. So if your definition of a management zone is again in regulation, given the short version here, it's effectively a discrete and generally hydrologically contiguous area where dischargers decide to work collectively to meet the requirements of the nitrate control program. Compliance is evaluated collectively as a group of dischargers. If there's a stipulation in the regulation that in the case where a management zone crosses the boundaries of a groundwater basin or subbasin, then ultimately when the plan is evaluated for compliance purposes in the future, that compliance is assessed for each basin or subbasin. So for example, in the figure that you see here, this is an outline of the uh, Modesto and um, Turlock groundwater subbasins. Uh, where they are joined together, or at least they're contiguous to each other. This area is the proposed management zone that is being formed, but ultimately compliance, I mean, they can be one management zone, but compliance would be determined within the Modesto or within the Turlock subbasin. Next slide. All right, so what are the deliverables? If you're jumping in now, wonder, well, what do we need to do to form this management zone? Uh, the green box has already happened. The notice to comply went out, as I said, on May 29th. We're working in the yellow right now. We're forming the management zone and preparing a preliminary management zone proposal. That proposal was required to include something called an early action plan. That is the drinking water compliance component, which we will talk more about later in this presentation. The package, the proposal with the early action plan is due to the regional board by May, March 8th. And then there's a stipulation of regulation that the portion called the early action plan is to begin implementation within 60 days after submittal of a proposal. Uh, there is a note in the regulation that the board may ask, could, could delay that if they choose to, but if they don't say anything, uh, the management zone will begin implementation of that early action plan within 60 days or approximately May 8th of 2021. But you're not done. That's the first deliverable and the first step in implementation of the management zone. What will happen after that is the board will work interactively with them each management zone to find, uh, produce additional documents, go through various public review periods, and ultimately have a compliance plan for the future. So after submittal of the preliminary proposal, the board will take that, they submit it to public review and comment, the board will get back to the management zone and let you know what needs to be addressed uh, to finalize the proposal. And the management zone then produces that final proposal with 180 days of receiving comments from the board. Once again, the board will take that final proposal, they will be subjected to public comment, and they will provide uh, a notice to you at some point that they've accepted the final management zone proposal, and then you now have another 180 days to produce what is called the management zone implementation plan. And if you really dig into the regulation, that, that's where the rubber hits the road. I mean, it's not just the early action plan that's already being implemented at this point, but there is a larger plan that needs to be developed and implemented over many year period to achieve all the goals of the nitrate program. Once the board approves that implementation plan, then it'll have a schedule and activities and actions and those will be carried out over that long-term time period. Next slide. So to close out this segment, what goes into the current deliverable that we're working on, we've just begun, that's developing the preliminary proposal plus the early action plan. These are just the highlights. Uh, first off, you need to define your area, which we just showed you is effectively the two sub-basins joined together. We work to identify participating permitted dischargers, who's in the plan, uh, do a lot of characterization work, uh, particularly understanding current nitrate conditions in groundwater, uh, understand what the current concerns are and issues are with who's potentially impacted in their drinking water by high nitrate levels, uh, identify what practices are ongoing currently by those who are members of the management zone. So what do you currently do if you're a discharge in your permit or through your general order? And then, as I said, it requires an early action plan to assure safe drinking water in the short term while working on long-term solutions. And we'll come back again and talk about the early action plan again later. Next slide. All right, so that, that's the first portion of the presentation. I'm gonna turn it back to Lydia, 
Uh, we're going to do a pause here for those who may have questions on more of the foundational information. I do have one question here from Walt Ward. He'd like you to define the regulated community. Who is a discharger? Yeah, Richard, you could add, answer that well. Okay. If you hold a discharger in this case is someone who holds a permit that's been issued by the regional board. And those permits come in different forms. Uh, there's a number of them that are in, what we call individual permits. So it's to a specific entity like a wastewater facility, could be a winery, could be a food processor. Uh, there's also uh, permittees who are subject to what's called a general order and you uh, have to meet the requirements of the general order. The same permit applies to say an industry. So for example, the dairy uh, community has a general order that applies to their permittees. And so we'll have a slide here in a little bit that identifies the number of permittees that exist currently within these two sub basins. So anybody who holds a permit. Yeah, and I guess I would expand on that by saying within, within irrigated agriculture, the, the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition holds the permit for its members. So the individual growers will not be receiving this notice. We will, we have been doing outreach to our members and will continue to notify them in these specific basins uh, about the responsibilities that we'll be undertaking. Okay, we have another question from Debbie Webster. Are each of the basins going to have separate budget and funding or is this going to be one pool? Additionally, will prioritization be across basin? Yes, each basin is going to have a separate budget because we really think about it when the water deliveries begin or there's fill stations installed, those will be unique or specific to a basin. So only those in those basins will be responsible for covering the costs of those, uh, of those fixed, uh, the costs of those projects. And then the prioritization across the basin, I guess I use the Turlock Basin and we'll see this map shortly. We have an area that is very high nitrates to the western half of the Turlock Basin. The eastern half next to the foothills has less problems with nitrates. I don't wanna say no problems, but the efforts, the focus of the activities would initially be focused on that high nitrate area. And, and Richard, we, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but we're, we will be segmenting our basins based on that critical need of replacement water. Okay. Question here from uh, Rob Neenan. He's wondering if the slide deck is going to be available to everyone after the meeting. Yeah, we'll be posting that on our website, this presentation and any future presentations from our community outreach meetings and other things. And you'll see that web address at the end of the presentation and also it's on your the invite that you got for this meeting. Another question from uh, John Avila. Will any discharger who wishes to take pathway A have to do the same preparation work as the VWC is doing for pathway B participants? Yeah, Richard, you wanna answer that? Certainly. All right, the, there's a lot of preparation work, but it may be a little bit different. Uh, the pathway A has very specific requirements where you have to categorize your facility based on your impacts to the shallow groundwater, which is a little bit different approach then the management zone is focused on a what's called the upper zone of groundwater systems. There's some distinctions there, but you have to assess your groundwater just as we're assessing our groundwater for the management zone, but you have to focus it in the context of your facility. You also need to understand your zone of contribution. Where are the impacts of your facility's activities? Uh, what's the extent of those impacts to, to groundwater? And when, once you categorize your facility and as are defined in the regulation, then that triggers maybe some potential other activities that you may need to do to submit your notice of intent. Yeah, one other thing to mention that we've had in conversations with the regional board in the past 12 to 24 months. And it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly detailed. 
Yes, sorry, Richard. Yeah, it's very detailed, but one other factor is that you could pr prepare a path pathway A approach and the regional board may or may not say that that is acceptable. And so that, that's one to keep in mind uh, when, you are, when you make your selection. And I would just throw, I would encourage you because the board is, is open to working with you, is uh, contact them if you need a better understanding. Yes. Okay, there are no other questions at this time. Oh, we have one that just came in. Pathway A is not, it's more of a comment. Pathway A is not recommended for dairies. There's a question from John Avila. How about feedlots? Boy, Richard, that I believe they're under the dairy permit. Are they not? Are there? Can I talk? Am uh, I able we... to speak? Yes. Yeah, there, JP, please. He was the caveat with the dairy care or the <laughs> Central Valley Dairy Representative Monitoring Program. JP? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I responded in the comment box to John's question because I know he represents di several dairies. Um, I just, yeah, neither feedlots nor dairies would, would, we would recommend, the dairy industry does not recommend taking Pathway A in any way, shape, or form. And I'm happy to take questions offline from anybody who has any questions about that, but there are numerous, numerous reasons for that. Thanks, JP. Okay, Richard, do you want to continue with your slide? Yes. Uh, all right, let's go to the next slide. And I, very good, thank you. All right, so we're going to now talk more about the deliverables for the project uh, plumbing management zone proposal. Where are we with the various aspects of de development of those? And we'll start with the preliminary characterization of the management zone. And I'm going to turn it over to Barb Dogich with Ludorf uh, Scalmanini Consulting Engineers. Thanks, Richard. Um, so I'm going to talk about the management zone characterization that's required um, for the Modesto and Turlock basins for our management zone. Next slide, please. So um, within the PMZP or the preliminary management zone proposal document itself, we are required to characterize the management zones using the list of features seen here. So geography, jurisdictions, um, GSAs or groundwater sustainability agencies, other water management entities, such as water districts, um, public drinking water systems, disadvantaged communities, as well as characterizing the land use of the area. So this characterization is not gonna be anything new. We're gonna mostly rely heavily on existing documents, such as groundwater sustainability plans or GSPs that the subbasins have already been working on for um, the Sustainability Groundwater Management Act. So the initial assessment of groundwater conditions, however, the last bullet on this slide, um, which I'll get into a little bit more in the next few slides, does consist of some new work and new data. Next, please. So the initial assessment of groundwater conditions for the PMZP is aimed at using readily available data. So again, we're going to rely heavily on GSPs to fill in the information for the hydrogeology, what's going on with groundwater flow directions and groundwater elevations in the, in the subbasins. And it will also, the document itself will contain a brief discussion about the upper zone delineation. So um, Richard touched on this briefly, but basically um, some previous work by CV Salts has defined different zones of the subsurface. So the upper zone is what the nitrate control program for pathway B cares about the most. So um, that's what we'll be focusing on in, in this work. Um, the actual nitrate water quality data, however, this is all going to be um, relatively new analyses. So um, we've been downloading and compiling all of the publicly available um, nitrate groundwater quality data. So this comes from DWR, the Division of Drinking Water, the USGS, GeoTracker, Gamma, and others. Um, we also have been performing some outreach to all of the counties in our area of interest to request non-public data. So that might include um, 
small water systems or community water systems data that is not reported to the Division of Drinking Water, but may be reported and available digitally um, to the counties. So um, <clears throat> this might also include well testing data associated with new well permits that the county collects. So we're always looking for more data to fill in any gaps. So if you know of any non-public data or non-county data and we haven't asked you for it yet, please feel free to send it our way. Um, even if we can't use it for this go around, we could still incorporate it in the next phase of the management zone, which would be the final management zone proposal. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. Uh, next, please. So the next few slides are gonna focus on the groundwater nitrate analysis that we've been conducting to date. Um, as of a couple of days ago, the, what you see here on the screen is the status of the nitrate groundwater data that we have available to use. So um, because the nitrate control program is kind of zoomed in on the upper zone of the subsurface, we have to characterize and cate categorize um, wells with nitrate data into different depth zones. So this is performed using a combination of well depths and well types as that information is available. So some wells are reported with well depth information. That makes it easy because you just look at what the well depth is and compare that to what the CV salts mapping of the bottom of the upper zone is um, and you can put it in the correct category of depth zone. If well depth information is not available but well type data is available then um, what I do is attempt to um, estimate the, the well depth using DWR's well completion report database. So the DWR database has um, statistics associated with every square mile in, in the state where you can determine what the average well depth is for a particular well type um, within that one square mile area. So that estimate of well depth is then used to basically put that particular well with nitrate data into the box, into the category of either upper, lower, or if we don't know, then it would go into the unknown category. So, um, so if there if there is no um, well depth or well type information, then that well is put into the unknown category. Um, the table here shows the breakout of data by source and depth zone. So as you can see, there are a lot of wells categorized in that unknown zone. Um, this means those wells didn't have depth or type information, so we have no way of knowing which category to put it in. Um, the chart on the right is illustrating the availability of groundwater data by depth over time. So, you know, we're trying to figure out what the ambient conditions are of nitrate and groundwater, um, but we, we want to focus on, you know, what's been recently happening, what the current conditions are. Um, so we need to figure out um, what's the best, most recent time period possible. So um, just, Let's see. Uh, I just wanted you to see uh, what the distribution, distribution of data looks like by well type. And if we took the um, time period of the last 20 years, so post 2000 um, versus the last 10 years, which is the chart all the way on the right. Um, so there's a lot less data, but as you'll see in some later slides, um, it kind of turns out okay. So next slide, please. So even though the nitrate control program and the PMCP document focuses on recent nitrate conditions, um, it's also important to see which areas in the management zone have ever experienced elevated nitrate. Um, that's not to say that maybe those nitrate problems have faded away or you know, disappeared over time, but this is just a good way of um, understanding where elevated nitrate has occurred in the past and in the present. So this map is showing the um, maximum nitrate condition ever tested in any well in all the different zones, even in an unknown zone um, over time. So we have data from 1943 to 2020, and this map is showing all the wells that we have data for um, as of a couple of days ago. So the red dots are, are indicative of wells that have exceeded the drinking water MCL, or the maximum contaminant level, of 10 milligrams per liter as nitrogen, um, and the orange dots are considered to have elevated nitrate. So they haven't surpassed or exceeded the MCL, but they still um, are something to watch, basically. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide shows us the, the breakdown of those maximum 
from data points by depth for all samples taken from any time that we have a record of. So between 1943 and 2020. The map on the upper left shows the maximum nitrate ever measured in wells completed in the upper zone. The um, map on the right shows the lower zone and the center map shows the wells in an unknown depth category. So unfortunately, there are so many wells with nitrate data that we don't know the depths for. Um, the map showing the maximum nitrate in that center unknown map, unknown depth zone map, has the most spatial coverage. So even though we don't know if the well is completed in the upper or lower zone, if any well exhibits elevated nitrate, we care about it. Comparing the upper zone map to the unknown zone map highlights some particular areas of interest. So you can see the area within and to the west of Modesto which is um, in the northern part of the map um, that looks to have um, some slightly elevated dots, wells. Um, the area between Waterford and Modesto also shows to be a little hot spot. And um, the area along the um, surrounding the city of Turlock in the Turlock subbasin seems to have a lot of high hits and the area along the southwestern border of the Turlock Subbasin. Um, and as Perry mentioned before, you know, these, these maps really help show us where, um, where we have lack of data. So the e eastern part of both of these subbasins, you see a lot less dots, right? There's a lot less dots to the east in both subbasins. However, the dots that we do have, at least in the unknown zone, for example, if you look at that center map on the bottom, a lot of those dots are green, which means there isn't elevated nitrate. So that's a good thing. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so in order to estimate the ambient nitrate conditions in the upper zone, which is one of the things we need to do for the early action plan and for the PMZP document, um, we have to select an appropriate time period for our analysis. So the time period has to be recent in order to capture nitrate conditions that are relevant, but it also has to cover enough area spatially so we can get a good idea of where elevated nitrate is a problem for people in this area. This slide is now comparing the nitrate data for two recent time periods. So on the left, we see that the last 20 years, or post-2000, um, and on the right, the last 10 years, post-2010, we have the different nitrate concentrations. So the maps on the top are showing what the maximum nitrate measured in all the wells have been for each time period. So comparing these upper maps to the lower maps where we only have wells completed in the upper zone, you can see how much our data availability drops. Um, but if you look from the left to the right, the differences aren't so great. Like they are basically telling the same story. Um, and the coverage seems pretty similar from left to right. So for that reason, we elected to use the most recent and shorter time period, the post-2010, for our ambient analysis of nitrate groundwater quality in the upper zone. Next slide, please. Okay, um, this slide shows us what uh, the spatial interpolation of the average upper zone nitrate within the past 10 years looks like. So um, this is a uh, the spatial interpolation used a search radius of one mile um, and assume that that kind of makes an assumption that beyond about a mile, um, the upper zone nitrate could potentially be different or vastly different. So we have less, less certainty as you go farther away from a data point. So we used one mile as our search radius for the spatial interpolation. Um, the speckled kind of splash colorful nature of this estimated ambient nitrate Seen in this map is um, indicative of the variability and the heterogeneity of several factors, including the geology of the area and the land use of the area. So unfortunately, you can see there are a lot of gap areas in both subbasins, um, most notably in the east, but some as well in the in the northern part of the Turlock subbasin. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk about the next steps for the initial assessment. Uh, this will include making any adjustments to the maps you already saw if we receive any new non-public data this week. Um, the previous maps showing the, the spatial interpolation, sorry, the map in the slide just previously um, that showed us the estimated ambient nitrate in the upper zone is gonna be used to identify areas of elevated nitrate. 
So those areas that were shaded orange or red, um, those areas will be used to determine the number of domestic wells and the population of people that might be affected by elevated nitrate con concentrations in both the Modesto and Turlock management zones. So that map will also be used to estimate the number of um, domestic wells and population of people within those gap areas or those areas where we don't know what the ambient upper zone nitrate is. Um, the last step in the initial assessment is to identify public water systems and specifically public water supply wells that have nitrate exceedances. Um, ideally, the public water systems have nitrate treatment, so it wouldn't be a problem for drinking water, but it's good to know where those problems are and what's being done about them before the consumer drinks the water. So this information will not only be used to help the, develop the early action plan, but will also be documented in the PMCP itself. Thank you. Next slide. So I'll pass it on to for a second and see if we have any questions. I don't see any in the chat room or any hands raised, but anybody have any questions? Okay, hearing none, Richard can proceed. All right, thank you, Barb. And so she ended on that assessment work that they're doing is critical to the early action plan and identifying uh, where um, we need to target for addressing concerns with uh, drinking water in the management zone area. So I'm going to shift gears here and talk about another element of the management zone proposal that we need to address and it's called discharger outreach. Be very brief on this. So next slide please. So it, we want as many dischargers in the area to join the management zone uh, to, so we can all work collaboratively together. And if you're interested in, in how many other dischargers there are within this area, the table at the bottom of this slide is based on a database uh, prepared by the regional board. In fact, that database is the basis from which they uh, generated their notice to comply letters. And it's divided into two sides. Uh, the left side is the general orders, those who are subject to a the dairy general order or a confined bovine feeding order or the poultry order. And on the right side are the individual permits that have their own permit to operate their facility. I don't show the uh, irrigated lands program here. As Perry mentioned earlier, the notice to comply went to the East San Joaquin Water Quality Coalition as a representative for all the growers. Uh, each grower did not receive an individual letter. So as we see here, uh, the, those under general orders, or there's many of them, uh, under the various either dairy, poultry, or confined feeding. There are much fewer individual permits, but there are still uh, a fair number. And by now, some of you may have already, if you are one of these dischargers, you may have already received a call from a representative of the Valley Water Collaborative uh, or the project uh, to talk with you and introduce you to the management zone. And if you haven't received that contact yet, you will be very soon. Next slide. So our goal in the outreach uh, process is not to uh, harass you, to badger you, or to uh, make you join the management zone. What we're trying to do is our due diligence to understand which per, uh, permittees really do want to be part of this management zone and to know that information as soon as possible because it helps develop our proposal. So initially, we'll be doing this outreach to see how many uh, entities would like to join the management zone. But ultimately, uh, our goal is to conduct what we would call a reasonable amount of outreach. We, we will reach a point where we, don't, we won't bother you. And uh, if you, we contact you and you say you wanna go path A, that, that's good information, we will document that. Uh, for our purposes, if you are on the fence and not sure, so at the time we reach out to you, we will strongly encourage you to stay involved in this process so that you can make a decision when you're ready to make that. But ultimately, it is not the management zone's re responsibility to decide your pathway, that is the decision of each discharger or group of dischargers working collectively together. And ultimately document the outcome in the, the proposal when we submit it in March. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears and talk about really a key element of the proposal, and that's the early action plan. Give you some highlights of what this is all about and what we're doing to develop that plan and then uh, we'll move from there. So next slide. 
All right, so the early action plan is all about finding or implementing temporary solutions to those that currently are believed to be impacted by elevated nitrate in groundwater. It's impacting their drinking water. This is a conceptual figure that uh, we use to kind of illustrate uh, what the early action plan is intended to do versus the overall management zone implementation plan, which if you recall from a few slides back is the ultimate deliverable for the management zone and it's the guide for uh, compliance with the program over the long term. Early action plan is to do just what it says, to get busy early and address drinking water concerns. And so along the x-axis, the year one, two, three, four is where we are now. We're into what year one. The notice to comply on the very left there has already occurred and we are in the process of developing that plenary management zone proposal with an early action plan. As I said earlier, it must be implemented within 60 days of submittal, unless you hear from the board that you shouldn't do so, but we will assume they'll say yes. And that red line indicates that there's a quick ramp up in the area served by the early action plan to provide temporary drinking water solutions. These could be of various types. We'll talk a little bit more about what that might include in a moment. And that program will continue, frankly, as long as necessary. Yeah, the ultimate goal, though, is through the management zone implementation plan is to replace early action with permanent solutions. So it's not a reaction or a reactive approach anymore. It's now solving the problem going forward. And the green line represents that at some point that program will uh, be implemented through the management zone implementation plan. It will grow over time as you deal with the problem over a long term. Next slide. So what goes into the early action plan? If you take all the components are in the regulation, you can break it down to four basic parts. Uh, the most important probably uh, is the upper left, community engagement. The plan is to be developed with uh, collaboration with the local community to identify uh, these uh, short-term solutions so that the early action plan is responsive to the needs of the local community. At the same time, coordinate with those who are not, not required to implement the early action plan, the people that are not discharged, but also collaborate with these folks. Because there's a lot of entities in within the management zone boundary that have interest in making sure their community has safe drinking water. So this could be a county office, it could be public health department. Uh, there's a lot of entities that would qualify as a non-discharger. So we want to coordinate with those as well. And some of you on the phone may be on this call because you've already received you are on our mailing list, we put you on there because you represent an agency that might have interest in this program as it moves forward. The early action plan needs to include a temporary replacement drinking water program. So the bottom left slice of the pie is that actual program. There needs to be a well testing program included to provide an opportunity for residents who might be concerned whether or not they have a well that has uh, elevated nitrate, provide them opportunities to have their well tested and also provide in the case they do, provide them with an opportunity to have replacement water. There are different ideas out there that are being implemented in other areas or being considered ranging from a bottled uh, filling station where you, you go to a location and you obtain your water and fill up bottles or actually having bottled water delivered to your home or something else. There, These will all be discussed through a community engagement process. Finally, more of the nuts and bolts, uh, element of the early action plan is things that have to be included like how is it going to be funded, how, what's the schedule for implementation, uh, typical administrative elements like that. Next slide. As regards to the community engagement, as I indicated, it's an important component. The uh, State Water Board very recently put out a guidance specific to the early action plans and how they should be developed and things that should be considered and the community engagement process has came out, I believe in June of this year, and we're using it as our guide for community engagement in this area. And uh, the, it goes through on how you might work with your community to come up with solutions, what some of those solutions might be. This management zone, the Modesto Turlock Management Zone, will hold its first community outreach meeting uh, on November 4th from 3 to 4 p.m. That's next week. And a second one, which will be the same information for those who need a better time, We'll also provide the same information on November 5th from 6 to 7 p.m. The first notice of that meeting was sent out yesterday, uh, late on the 28th, and we will provide follow-up notices as we move forward. 
We are encouraging stakeholders who are on this call and uh, any other people you know to, if you know someone who think you think should participate in these meetings, please let us know so we make sure they're included on our mailing list. Next slide. With that, Perry, I'm gonna turn it back to you to uh, talk about these last few items. Okay, and there's a couple of questions in the chat. We'll, we'll get to those after a couple more quick slides. Next, please. So the preliminary management zone proposal is due in the early action plan on March 8th. That is on all of our calendars on the board and those of us following closely, a lot of work already started with, uh, with, with the Valley Water Collaborative and GEI and LUDAR. So we're heading in uh, to, to have meet that deadline. And this is, as you see on the bottom, this is the first stakeholder meeting and we're hoping to have, um, you know, holidays and such, notwithstanding a stakeholder meeting every month similar to this to give you an update on the progress and to get feedback once the draft documents are available. And so you see those every month through February at least. And, and I anticipate even once that plan is submitted, that we'll, keep, we'll continue having these stakeholder meetings as needed. And then I went backwards on the top half of the axis here. We have the first community outreach meeting next two meetings next, uh, uh, next week on Wednesday and Thursday. And then in early December, we're, we will have another series of meetings uh, and these will all be virtual, of course. Uh, we'll have a community outreach meeting. We expect to have those, another one of those community outreach meetings in January. It's not indicated here, but it's really going to be based on reaction we get from those first uh, or first four meetings. And then we will have a, a first draft of the early action plan available for review in uh, late January. And then We'll have the overall preliminary management zone proposal ready early February with another stakeholder meeting right before we hopefully are finalizing that in late February. So this is uh, again a, a tentative time schedule, but I think we're going to need to hold to this pretty tight lead to make that March 8th deadline. So next slide. So we have the Valley Water Collaborative website up and running it's uh, as, as they say under construction updating and adding to it almost on a daily basis but you can go there to find this presentation there will also be this link that you see here a cv salinity coalition is the the entity that was formed when cv salts was in process still in process and has been meeting uh, together for over 10 years at least 10 years they have a very good website site with a lot of background on CV salts, both the salt component and the nitrate component. And I'll say just one word on the salt component. Apparently the notice to comply for that is now uh, on deck and is likely to be sent out in December. So those of you that are at WDRs with salt aspects are going to be getting that notice to comply then. And then uh, I've got my, uh, my email address here uh, i've got gmail so it helps uh, thankfully blocks a lot of the things that some emails get but it does not block any of these uh, uh legitimate e emails from folks like yourself anyway the the, the web the website has uh, the this and future presentations as i mentioned the related information and then uh, importantly if you're not on our list or know somebody that wants to get on the list please sign up for either the stakeholder um, follow-up or notifications and or the community outreach meeting notifications. And then finally, the next stakeholder meeting scheduled for December 3rd, we'll be sending out an announcement and then any related documents that might be useful for that presentation. So I think we're gonna to go to questions now. Lydia, you wanna tee them up and please uh, don't hesitate to come off mute and, and pose a question or raise your hand so we can answer any of these questions. So we have we have two comments in, in the chat that I, I can go ahead and, and read. Um, the first comment is from Michael Claiborne. It says, I agree that ideally public water systems will have treatment for nitrate. That is not always the case, especially for small water systems serving disadvantaged communities. 
uh, to which Vicki Jones responded, um, small water systems with fewer than five connections are currently unregulated. So testing for nitrate is not a requirement at this time for those wells water systems. Uh, the State Water Resource Control Board is looking at this issue based on SB 200 and the SAFER program. Richard, why don't you start on that and I'll add on uh, to that comment. As far as our responsibility for the small systems, we, we will be engaging with them, I understand, in the development of these plans. Is that not correct? And you're on mute, Richard. Uh, of course, I'm on mute. Um, yes, we will be doing that. And part of what uh, Barb and her team are doing at the moment is identifying, making sure we understand who all those systems are. And then, yes, that's included ultimately in the outreach to make sure we are connecting with those as well. So, yes, we agree with these statements and understand them, and uh, they need to be addressed. Okay. The next question, series of questions come from Jennifer Clary. Can you give us more information about the community outreach meetings? How are you advertising these? Are you providing translation? Are these meetings your only venue for community engagement? Yes, I'll, I'll take the first cut at that as well here. So right now, because of COVID, what we are doing is, is the same form, venue as we're gonna be doing Zoom. Um, conferences and our first list of outreach communication for the community groups has come from lists that we've obtained from the Turlock and Modesto GSAs. We are looking for for more names uh, that that is um, that's been a moderately challenging up in our area and we are hoping to expand that list to be as comprehensive as we can and at this point, uh, for the December meeting, we're gonna we'll see what the response is for this meeting next week, and we'll really be looking for suggestions how we might add, uh, expand that advertising. Really, I'm 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 putting the the majority of our emphasis. Or I think we are in the early next year when we have some solid information to provide the communities. Not to say we're we're not going to be working on in these in these months uh, before the end of the year, but we will be expanding to make sure, expanding our list to make sure that we cover these communities, all of them that are impacted and do as well as we can. We're considering also expanding in the social media. Uh, we're debating on whether people or whether we're gonna be putting some funding into advertising into the, the Turlock Journal and the Modesto B. Likely we will. And then are, they, are we providing translation? Uh, in this first announcement that we sent out yesterday, we are asking for feedback if someone does need translation uh, for, we want to heads up at least two days in advance. And if we do get a notification that someone does need translation, we, we do have a person on standby uh, ready to have a, a parallel Zoom event that is translated. And some of you have seen that before. We can have a, a meeting going on at the same time with a different web address that the translator is doing a direct translation and seeing the same slides as, as uh, the English speaking presentation. And then um, these meetings will be the only venue for community engagement. Well, someday hopefully things will open up and we will be out in the communities having these meetings. But as, as of now, uh, we're gonna be using the, uh, the virtual approach. And then I see, my, I'm, I'm watching the chat then, we could prepare a flyer, we don't have one now, but we could prepare one very quickly if there is uh, some ideas on how we might distribute those. Unfortunately, with so many public places closed, uh, we even got offered to bring some to a school, but the school was closed. So I, it, it really is a challenge right now getting the word out, but you know, Michael, Jennifer, either of you, if you have ideas or Deb, uh, Deborah, please uh, help reach out to us. We're working with Self Help to utilize the contacts they have in this area. But uh, any assistance you can provide on that would be welcome. And Richard, I'm, I, I'm I on that. I think you covered it fairly well. It'll be interesting to see what response we get next week. Um, we are also, I think, in the list of options that you run through, Perry. We're also 
looking at, you know, what, what are the costs to do direct mailers and things like that. We're, we're trying to avoid that just right at the moment. The yeah. election, things like that, you know, people are getting tons of mailers, I'm sure, at their homes. I know I am. And so we want to, but we, there's ways, obviously, to do that through getting mailing lists and the like. Uh, but let's see what the response is for this round, and we'll add components as we go. Yeah, and I look at our community engagement on two levels. Now we're developing the plans. We will be having input provided by stakeholders in the community as the plans are being developed. But once we're in the early action plan and we've identified those priority areas, then that is the point where we're going to be doing direct mailing to the addresses that we understand to be outside of a public water system. We find some of these smaller systems that are out of compliance, or they certainly would be included. But at this point, for developing the plans, we're trying to reach out to the, the thought leaders, organizations, and, and general public that would be interested in providing input at this time. Um, yes. Uh, I want to add, um, Michael added in the chat, a flyer would be great. We tend to text flyers to folks and post them on social media. So, Michael, we will work with you to get you something uh, to send out. Uh, and Lydia has noted someone sent a comment, and I always appreciate this, the correct email for Valley, or not email, the website for Valley Water Collaborative is .org, not .com, and it's gotten repeated twice on here, and that, that is my emojis. And so www.valleywaterc.org. And whoever privately texted that, thank you. Well, Richard, I think that's about all we have. If there's any comments, it doesn't need to be a question, uh, any comments about uh, what you've heard or, or the anticipated activities in, in coming months. There are no other questions or hands raised to ask questions at this time, Perry. All right, then I, I think I'd, I'll say thank you everyone for participating. We have almost 50, uh, 50 names on our participant list. So I appreciate all of you calling in and, and uh, participating. We look forward to seeing you at, at our uh, future stakeholder meetings. And please, when you uh, go back to that announcement, if you have someone that should be on that list, don't hesitate to send us that name and then we will add them uh, to the list or you can go to the website and, and sign up in the same fashion. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.